very much. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. sorry, I have to read from notes, otherwise I forget what I'm saying. And I talk fast and in a Yorkshire accent, all of which I apologise for. I want to get these things done in 30 minutes. Um, the subject matter of this talk is basically an expansion of my chapter of the same name, Bring What You Expect to Find in Albion Dreaming, which I'm sure you're all clutching to your hearts. Uh, and it's going to be expanded into a book specifically about psychedelics and uh, free festivals in Britain, which uh, Rob Dickens' Cypress is publishing later this year. Um, so, this works. There you go. Um, I'm sure there are many audience members who've been at Burning Man Festival in America. Burning Man is an annual festival held in the high desert of Nevada. It started in 1986 at a full moon ritual held among a few friends and it's now up to about 50,000 people who attend it. Unsurprisingly, psychedelic drugs and the psychedelic experience is a huge driver and focus for Burning Man. Another feature of Burning Man is that those who attend need to be almost fully, so, fully self-reliant in terms of food, water and other supplies. Burning Man is, in short, completely different from the mainstream kind of festivals where people go just to be a consumer, and people make a big thing out of Burning Man. The audience and performers of Burning Man are often one of the same, creating a unique experience. And Burning Man is lauded as being a new revolutionary kind of festival. But history shows, history in Britain that is, that we in Britain had exactly the same kind of event long before Burning Man was a twinkle in its organisers' third eye. <laughs> These British events were known generically as the Free Festivals, and their heyday was between 1970 and 1986. Their names read like a litany of British counterculture events Glastonbury Fair, the Windsor Park Free Festivals, Watchfield, Trenty Show, the Medium Fairs, the Walsh Silas Simon Festivals, and many others. These festivals operated under the same ethos as Burning Man, one of self-reliance, and their motto was the title of my talk, Bring What You Expect to Find. And by Bring What You Expect to Find, I mean exactly that. The British Free Festivals thrived on the basis that if you wanted something to be at one of the events, whether that be food, water, shelter, entertainment, crafts or drugs, you took some responsibility to become part of the event by providing, in however small a degree, these things yourself. And my belief, and my contention in fact, is that the British Free Festival movement was driven and underpinned by the use and philosophy of psychedelic drugs, and it's directly through the existence and ethos of the Free Festival movement in Britain that the UK festivals that we see these days, such as Blastonbury, Sunrise, Green Man, and so and so, have come to exist. So you're all thinking now, yeah, psychedelics and free, free festivals, duh, a bit obvious, isn't it? And it is, yes. We come to take the presence of psychedelic drugs at any festival for granted. But dig deeper, and it's possible to trace the psychedelic roots of Britain's free festivals, and to realise that it was the growth of the psychedelically inspired free festivals and the culture which surrounded them, which eventually led to the establishment with a capital E. Um, we need to drop the E. Uh, the establishment's efforts to dismantle that culture and the drug that fueled it before its influence spread further into mainstream society. Free festivals in Britain came about as a response to a variety of emerging needs within the counterculture. Nightclubs and commercial rock festivals did not appeal to the sensibilities of acid-sensitised hippies who were questioning ideas of profit and control, wanting to be more than just consumers of entertainment industry product. There was a demand for events self-generated by the counterculture, which would provide hippies with gatherings where they could live out their lifestyle with like-minded people in a spirit of celebration and purpose. And another factor in the development of the counterculture was the growth of communes and the squatting movement in London and other big cities Entire streets in London and elsewhere had been colonised by squatters and it was a natural progression from community in the cities to commun communality in the countryside. During the 1970s, local authorities evicted thousands of squatters. Many went on the road permanently, their lifestyle becoming intertwined with the free festivals. Writing in Festival Eye magazine, Christoph summed up the contribution of squatters to the free festival scene thus. The free city of Camden, which became the base for early Stonehenge festivals, was a loose street-by-street -street network of squatters, revolutionaries and artists who subscribed to the philosophy of giving and practice consensus politics. The first festivals at Stonehenge were the expression of this kind of community feeling. They were spontaneous happenings and quickly attracted other avant-garde groups and communes from around the country. The eviction of the free city of Camden made tens of thousands of people homeless and many of them took to the road. The festival became the community's home rather than its playground. The first multi-day free festivals, Fulton City, held an Eclipse Common near Worthing, West Sussex, in July 1970. The, the organisers made the purpose of the festival clear, quote, Fulton City is attempting to provide a three-day environment designed to the needs and desires of the freak, not just a situation set up to relieve him of his money. There was no entry free, food was cheap or free, and there was an endless stream of music from the cream of Britain's underground bands. 
For the 3,000 people who attended, the festival proved, proved to be enormous fun. Many went to feral for a few days, living under tarpaulins and plastic in the woods. LSD was in great demand, but was more than matched by the supply. One veteran of the event, Tom, remembered, quote, a genuine Californian hippie in long white robes holding a plastic bag with thousands of hits of pure acid came along trying to give us some tabs. But all the people around the fire were surfing on lots of clean, high quality acid and everyone had more than enough anyway. The annual Glastonbury Festival, Glastonbury Fair as it used to be known, is a unique British cultural institution. Each year in June, on or around the summer solstice, hundreds of thousands of people flock to Worthy Farm in the Somerset village of Pilton to camp for three days to experience the dizzying kaleidoscope of music, theatre and arts on offer. The festival caters for all ages, cultures and socio-economic backgrounds and these days is somewhat cynically referred to as a holiday camp for middle class hippies. Yet the origins of this quintessentially British event are rooted deep in the counterculture and closely linked with LSD. In fact, had it not been for the psychedelic focus of the first major Glastonbury event, the festival in its present form would not exist. But Glastonbury itself, as Andy Letcher mentioned earlier, I'm just going to overlap with him a little bit, is an interesting place. Steeped in myth and legend, it's claimed that Jesus visited Glastonbury, UFOs were seen over the tour, ley lines, wherever they are, Crisscross the area, sending serpent power through the West Country, a terrestrial zodiac could be discerned in landscape features, and so on. These and many other legends have recently been revivified for the counterculture by John Michel in his books The Flying Source of Vision and The View Over Atlantis. And as per um, Andy Letcher's slide earlier on, Michel wrote, It was, I think, in 1966 that I first went to Glastonbury in the company of Harry Fanlight, who was a poet. We had no very definite reason for going there, but it had something to do with strange lights in the sky, new music, and our conviction that the world was about to flip over on its axis so that heresy would become orthodoxy and an entirely new world of order would shortly be revealed. Michel was the counterculture's resident philosopher, then Merlin, a university educated polymath who was now educating Britain's hippies about their spiritual heritage. Michel lived in the hippie enclave of Notting Hill Gate, as comfortable at counterculture events as he was hanging out with the Rolling Stones and minor aristocracy. Michel made no secret of the fact that he was an acid head, and his books were key spiritual guides on the bookshelves of every thinking hippie's pad, offering a source of discussion and speculation for those long LSD journeys towards dawn. Michel showed, and this is quite crucial, and Andy Letcher mentioned this, Michel showed that there was no need to take the hippie trail to the east when the West Country was just down the M4. And the visual imagery of Glastonbury was everywhere in the underground press. One is a very good example of this is the cover issue of one of the scarcer underground magazines with a fantastic name of Albion. And as you can see there, dragons and UFOs teeming the skies over Glastonbury Tor, here stylised as a woman's breast, while swords, serpents and geomantic imagery are visible in the earth below. Hippie travels in search of psychedelic enlightenment had settled in the area from the mid-sixties onwards, fuelled by Michelle's exposition of Glastonbury as a sacred place, and it was against this backdrop that the Glastonbury festivals developed. The first festival in 1970 was a low-key low event which flopped, so Michael Evis left the organisation of the 1971 event, the classic Glastonbury Fair, to a rather unlikely group of people. Andrew Kerr first met Winston Churchill's granddaughter Arabella in the late 60s while working on Randolph Churchill's biography of the great political leader. Kerr was regularly taking LSD and enjoying being part of the counterculture. The idea to hold the festival in Glastonbury was planted at the 1969 Isle of Wight Rock Festival. Kerr was outraged that large areas near the stage were cordoned off for the press and privileged few. On the drive back to London, he announced to his friends, quote, we've got to have a proper festival and it's got to have at least some cosmic significance. Let's have it at the summer solstice at Stonehenge. Kerr's intention to hold this festival at Stonehenge was put in abeyance when he was given Michael Evis' telephone number. A meeting was arranged and Kerr duly prepared by spending the night before a top Glastonbury tour on LSD. Evis readily agreed to the use of his land and Kerr, assisted by Churchill and using a small inheritance, formed solstice capers to organise the 71 event. The Observer magazine wrote, Kerr has the intensity of a man with a deep spiritual obsession. He claims he is trying to recreate a prehistoric science whose huge energies are not recognised by modern society. His ideas are based on the writing of Antiquarian John Michel, who in a book called The View Over Atlantis recently elucidated the spiritual engineering which he says were known over the ancient world. Jeff Dexter, veteran DJ from London's UFO Club, and incidentally the first man to dance the twist in Britain in 1963, <laughs> organised the music, consisting of the hippie bands, uh, including Freak Favourites, Quintessence, Bridget Schwartz, Hawkwind, Gong, Traffic and Arthur Brown. These bands were all very much open about their use of LSD and strove to create a music and atmosphere to be experienced under the influence of psychedelic drugs. 
Psychedelics of all kinds, including mescaline, were freely available at Glastonbury, but LSD was prevalent. Author William Bloom said, nearly everyone was tripping at one stage or another. Sometimes it was being given away. The festivals would not have been what they were without hallucinogens. Arabella Churchill didn't indulge, but she said she knew there was a lot of acid because this man came up with a large briefcase and said, this is full of acid, man. I was going to sell it, but everyone's doing everything for free, so here, give it to everybody. <laughs> The mixture of free psychedelics and living out the hippie ethos made the Glastonbury Fair the prototype for subsequent events. LSD, um, where am I? LSD brought uh, people together around the campfires at night, making the already otherworldly experience appear completely divorced from the 20th century and Western civilization. Mick Farron summed it up this, thus, we might as well have been in the 6th or 7th or in the 26th century, as we told tall travellers' tales of intoxication, about witting the law of the lights in the sky, lost continents, the lies of government, collective triumphs and personal stupidity, while the music of past, present and future roared from the on the pyramid stage. Soon after the success of the 91, 1971 Glastonbury Fair, moves were afoot to develop the large-scale free festivals that were run throughout the summer. Uh, and it's important to trace the roots and motivations of the individuals behind them. Um, these festivals didn't occur, they were initiated and planned by three key psychedelic visionaries that we'll come to shortly. The three festivals held in Windsor Great Park in, near London in 1972, 3 and 4 were the genesis of a free festival culture which has lasted in one form or another to the present day. This wouldn't have happened without the efforts of one Bill Uwe Dwyer, a crucial psychedelic mover and shaker. Dwyer had been an acid dealer in Sydney, Australia in the late 60s. He was eventually deported uh, to his home country of Ireland because um, the acid that he was selling in Sydney was acid that he was buying from the police and taking it off other dealers. Uh, and when he started buying it off uh, another dealer, the police decided to bust him because they weren't all playing happily. <laughs> that's, that's commerce, I suppose. Um, Dwyer was eventually, as I say, deported to, um, to Ireland. Then he came to London. Uh, he was often seen in full erratical flow at Hyde Park, as he's here, uh, eulogising about, among other things, LSD. As a committed squatter, he was also ranted against paying rent, and he had a vision on acid whilst tripping in Windsor Great Park of having a massive festival there which would attract a million people. The 1972 event uh, attracted a few hundred people, causing no great problems. Uh, acid was freely available to those who wanted it, um, and bol bolstered by the success of this event and of the growing numbers of other small free festivals, the second the Windsor Festival in 73 was a much bigger affair. LSD was not only sold at the Windsor Festivals, Large quantities were given away. Roger Hutchinson, who designed the archetypal Stonehenge Free Festival poster, who died a couple of years ago, recalls an incident at the 73 festival when he was, I'm not sure if this is on the slide, uh, yes, it was at a stage, and um, chap came up to him and said, does anyone out there fancy getting a little bit higher tonight? We've got some little tablets here, yours for the taking, free and literally. The audience just came up as one and went straight for the stage. It wasn't a very clever thing to do. The idea of it was sound, I suppose, in a way, but it was already well into the festival and people were already pretty wrecked. And then to put on some equally good, extremely good microdots at 200 micrograms plus was an absolute bloody disaster. <laughs> <laughs> there were people who'd never tripped before. People who used to London microdot, soft southerners. Um, <laughs> which was half the strength. So they were expecting one thing and they got something that took them to a completely new level. Some people had taken more than one. And it was just chaos. <laughs> the Windsor poster for 1974 that tantalisedly advertised the presence of psychedelic intestines there, I think. Um, and, and as the event unfolded, it was clear that although there were no psychedelic intestines, there was a great deal of LSD. Release set up a bad trip tent and prepared themselves for the inevitable onslaught of the first acid casualties. One of the staff wrote, quote, a lot of us were running on natural speed by now and the first wave of heavy trippers inundated us fairly early. An inordinate number of people seem to be wankers, in quotes, i.e. sexually repressed individuals liberated in a bizarre kind of way by the acid. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a picture from Windsor 74, and that, I am almost certain, is me. <laughs> I mean, in this case, it's, that's, uh, the, that looks very much like the guy I was there with, and I was coming onto to some um, brown microdots at that very moment, which is why I look quite concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my book, I, I, I report Windsor 74, I, I pseudonymise myself as Alan States, but it was me. Uh, and I quote, there was a vast amount of acid at Windsor in 1974, everyone was talking about it, and it was obvious it was the focus of the festival. Around lunchtime on the Saturday, a guy came to our tent and asked if we wanted to score any acid. We did. 
We produced a bottle containing tiny brown microdots at 50p each. It was the strongest acid we had yet encountered, and the afternoon just dissolved in a blur of wild dancing and celebration. The effects of the extremely strong acid took their toll on the first day at Windsor. The release report continued, quote, by late afternoon, the area around the release ambulance was reminiscent of the scene by Her Hieronymus Bosch. Yea, there was lamentation, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. Those unprepared for the psychic and spiritual upheaval of LSD cause were unable to keep their thoughts to themselves, and as the release report dryly quotes, quote, oh, it's not there. Um, warning, uh, sorry, that worst of all were the juvenile philosophers who bellowed tedious cosmic observations about the state of the universe. <laughs> I think we've all been there at some time. Uh, the Free Festival um, newsletter published on the Sunday concurred on the strength of LSD available, and I think you can see it on here. Warning, brown acid is very strong, don't drop more than one tower. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, though many people took LSD during the day, the evening at Free Festivals was the optimum time to take acid. Uh, I remember a notice board appearing at Windsor each day with the suggested, quote, dropping times, the time of day at which LSD was best taken to enjoy the bands later in the evening. As the shadows lengthened, the real weirdness began. To enhance the LSD experience at Free Festival, several light shows had, had, had sprung up in Britain. We were projected heated oil slides and the like, um, uh, cartoons, image of spirituality and so on. This was um, a Sinica light show by John Andrews and he said, um, he knew full well why people were at free festivals and he said, quote, we cater in the main for trippers. When we started we'd been he very heavily into acid, the whole psychedelic thing, and I knew that hints rather than specific designs would prompt a reaction from our, our audience. And when people talk about the strength of acid in the 70s, and I always sound like John Paul Simpson when I talk about it, um, the acid that the Operation Julie were producing would lead to things looking like that in three dimension for many hours at a time. None of this going out and partying, the concept of a door for an hour or so might be a difficult thing to grasp, let alone going through one. <laughs> um, so veteran festival, veteran festival goer Nigel Ayres remembered LSD being given away at 1974 when he was nearly crushed in the handout of hundreds of tabs of free acid. Not all the LSD dealers were particularly concerned about the effect LSD could have and some people um, were just there to get completely wrecked and Nigel Ayres recalls seeing a tent with painted on it, I want to destroy your brain cells. <laughs> but there was also a hardcore of free festival attendees for whom LSD was an essential tool in the goal of creating a society of run anarchistic principles. Um, and the Winter Newsletter said, you know, we should celebrate with such fierce dancing the death of your institutions. Stonehenge also started, and Sto the guy behind Stonehenge was, I'm sure you all know, Wally Hope. Um, his name lives on in Free Festival legend to this day, uh, although people, I think, seem to have a slightly hagiographic view of him because he wasn't quite the saint, I don't think, that he was painted with being. He had a, a vision of LSD in Cyprus, um, and he decided that he wanted to reclaim the Sun Temple of Stonehenge. He set up camp in Stonehenge in 74, all the followers who came there were known as Wally. If you read the newspaper reports from the time, uh, the, the police asked them the name and say Wally so and so. Um, the camp was a drab affair with people sitting around doing very little. And unfortunately, there were ludicrous ar arguments and discussions about things like whether children should be given LSD. And that wasn't actually a theoretical discussion. A couple at the site actually did give their children LSD uh, on a daily basis, believing it was, quote, the religious thing to do. Uh, Wally was eventually um, imprisoned, possibly with a false charge of LSD, uh, fed various mind-controlling drugs and basically died. He's become a bit of a poster boy for the, uh, the Free Festival movement. It was around this time that the Central Drugs Intelligence Unit realised that the massive amounts of LSD produced in Britain um, and they were trying to trace their source. The powers that run Britain, the establishment of the capital E, decided that psychedelically oriented free festivals needed to be dealt with. Uh, the last thing a capitalist consumer society wants is an alternative society springing up in its heart that completely um, subverts and devalues uh, capitalism. Um, well, we've got to now. Don't you see things get through all this done? That's Wally there doing his uh, little videos. That's the uh, yes, yeah, I'm not there. That's his box where he was actually living <laughs> this day. Um, Uh, I don't know if you can, how you can see this, but acid became very, very widely and openly um, advertised at festivals with, with uh, notice boards outside dealer's tent advertising every kind of acid available. And it was at Watchfield Festival in 1975 when um, <coughs> the police really hit on the idea that there might be um, 
wholesale acid production taking place in Britain, which eventually led to Operation Julie, which Leif has um, dis discussed earlier. Uh, Trentish Show was a big festival in. Um, oh, yeah, that's, that's a long time ago, Operation Jewel, I think it's there. And that's what happens if you take LSD in mud. <laughs> <laughs> I always make sure it's dry outside. Take a towel. Um, just to support like this. Um, yes, Trentish Show in North Devon was a huge psychedelic festival. You can see by the gentleman's eyes there that he may have indulged in some form of chemical. This was the hardcore of Britain's hippies. Travellers, people were self sufficient, people wanted to create a society where things were done differently. And acid underpinned this. Um, uh, ex Pink Fairies manager Boss Goodman recalled everyone was eating pink microdots by the handful and talked about the chemists with a capital C giving away bags of acid. Um, where are we? The Megan Fairs in West Wales are again a hardcore um, acid uh, event. Um, they tried to expand the free festival ethos by promoting multicultural things there, but it was very, very hardcore LSD. Even the local paper noted, noted this with a quote that said, Naked she danced in the warm morning sun, her, her hips swayed suggestively to the beat of the music. On her back was scrolled in ballpoint, got any acid? On a rock nearby we chalk the words, reality is an illusion caused by LSD, please, where can I score? And one guy said, Chris Church remembers everyone was incapable due to the huge consumption of psychedelics. It was the only event I ever went to where it seemed as, this, as though the lysergic state was the normal state to be in. Another Megan veteran, Tim Rundle, recalls a very unhealthy quantity of liquid acid which emanated, I believe, from the cottage that would later be raided by the Jewelry Squad. Um, these are the psilocybin festivals. Not much has ever been written about. Mandel Lecture touched on his book Shroom. I'm going to be dealing with them extensively in my new book on uh, psychedelics and British free festivals. And the thing is, if the prevalence of psychedelics at pre festivals is generally kept away as far as possible from the public, media, and powers that be, the same cannot be said of the Welsh psilocybin festivals. Basically, the name, the clue was in the name. <laughs> psilocybin semisolata had been used on off by beatniks since the late 50s, but its use was fairly limited until about 1976. And then, possibly because of the jewelry busts, possibly because of, um, people wanted to try more organic psychedelics, they suddenly became massively pop popular. And the festivals came about in 76 following the police eviction of the Alan Valley Free Festival, where they moved people up the road about 16 miles to a stream valley called near Devil's Bridge. Um, first time the Free Festival had been directly and openly linked with the drug that it was uh, about. Uh, in 1979, um, it was a big festival, two or three thousand people, badges were produced like this. Anyone tell me which album that, that image comes from quickly? No, timed out, sorry, I was going to give a free book if you could, I guess that. Um, <laughs> And again, hardcore. This is a cartoon done by the eminent Hunt Emerson to demonstrate what uh, people's experiences of it uh, was like. Um, and the newspapers covered it while the Liberty Trippers flocked to Fungi Festival. Um, one, one attendee said they, they were disappointed because they went there, there was no entertainment, just people and drugs. <laughs> that reinforces the notion that the early Salisabian festivals were primarily about the gathering and taking of uh, drugs. The local council and police tried everything they could to stop it happening. Um, you can see there a bit of a, um, a, bit of a montage of uh, things like that. Um, two or three or four times a day there was a, a big walk, walk about to the, um, the, the festival kettle which was a blackened thing full of uh, psilocybin tea and it was passed around and people would top it up. And basically there were a lot of very stern people for several days just, just doing their thing happily on the riverside. Um, I must give you a quote from the local council's um, then secret information about this site, which I've got this, this festival, which I've got under the Freedom of Information Act, and they quoted, the small scattered local population is quite at the mercy of a lawless, nameless, and at the very least truculent and unsavoury army of occupation. It becomes noisy, filthy, repulsive, something between a fairground and a rubbish dump. We are polite because they seem slightly subnormal, and because we are afraid. <laughs> Free Festival veteran Bev Richardson was at the 1980 event and reflected that, quote, a lot of people came to pick mushrooms to sell. The market from them, from them isn't in this country, but on the continent in Holland and Germany. I suppose you could call it a hippie cottage industry. Um, blah, blah, blah. Penny Miller of the Festival Welfare Services reinforced the fact that although it was a psychedelic festival, it was a festival of a a genuine uh, alternative subculture. And she said, the Sabian Fair was a festival of doing. 
Almost everyone on site was trading in some way, mainly in food and crafts. People were very ingenious at thinking of new ways of exchanging money. The trading wasn't worked out on a high profit basis, but more on people working with whatever money and resources they had. Free festivals survived the 1970s and went forward into the 1980s. But the times were changing. Punk had happened and many of the people going on the road into free festivals were driven by different agendas and drugs other than psychedelics. Hard drugs such as heroin were on the scene and there was also the rise of the so-called brew crew. Hard drinkers and druggers to whom freedom was just another word for nothing left to lose. Free festivals were becoming less an environment in which to tolerate the psychedelic experience as more an event in which Class A drugs could be freely traded. The threat of violence and ripoff was never very far away and tents and vehicles were often broken into. Some of the blame for this had been laid at the feet of the wilder elements of the convoy, but it was equally likely that, as with all movements, the Free Festival movement was just coming to an end. Stonehenge continued and became something like uh, a Mad Max movie set up. Despite the darkening days of the Free Festival and the increasing numbers um, of people going there, a survey done at the 1984 event showed just how strong the psychedelic allegiance was. Of 500 festival goers who were questioned, over 70% of used LSD and or magic mushrooms. Half of the users at Stonehenge admitted they intended to use acid at the festival. The events at Nostal Priory and later at the 1985 Battle of the Beanfield effectively draw a line on the free festival culture. Small festivals still existed, but were very low key. Many of the um, real hardcore travellers went abroad to countries where they didn't feel persecuted, others came off the road and pursued a house based lifestyle. But the vision lives on, and the many small paid admission festivals, such as Sunrise, and in fact this conference, um, have kept the spirit of those early free festivals alive, albeit in a slightly more commercial way. Events such as Sunrise are still a suitable environment in which to enjoy psychedelics, whatever your particular person may be, and still, to a certain extent, flag bearers for the ethos of bring what you expect to find. Uh, that's it, I've had to truncate it, but there you go. Please.